Today I'm going to talk about the um, designer and uh, entrepreneur, Daniel Cotier, um, who has perhaps uh, greater claim than most as a major figure in the Gilded Age and as an international ambassador for aestheticism. Um, like many of the people and companies uh, who have been discussed today, uh, Cotier's activities and influence extended far beyond the boundaries of his native Glasgow. In Glasgow, um, Cotier was the founder and uh, driving force behind Cotier and Company, a firm of art furnishers. Uh, the company expanded. Uh, it, it was founded in London in 1869, and uh, it expanded with branches in uh, New York and Sydney and Melbourne. Although I'm going to restrict uh, today's discussion to um, looking at what was produced in London and in New York, given the um, restrictions on time. Um, this period, the firm ran until about 19, until 1915 in New York, uh, coincided with uh, well, what I call the aesthetic movement, certainly aestheticism, a fashion for artistic interiors. Cotier was able to draw on his experiences and contacts in Scotland, as well as his uh, activities as an international art dealer, to provide a unique offering to clients. With its talented associates and, and workforce of men and women, many of them Scots, Cotier and Company created a distinctive and cutting edge house style in interiors, furniture and stained glass in the 1870s. Although most of the interiors have been lost, uh, the opulence which Cotier created can still be documented through surviving descriptions, images and objects. Uh, and I'll be showing, uh, besides furniture, some ceramics and stained glass although my expertise uh, is, in, um, is in furniture. Um, Cotier's firm uh, could, um, could thus satisfy their inc impressive client base, which included some of the most successful industrialists in Scotland and in Europe and the United States. Uh, as we will see, the names of some of his associates and clients uh, still resonate today. People with names like Van Gogh, uh, Havemeyer, Vanderbilt, Whitney, Tiffany, and Frick, to name a few. Uh, Cotier was um, gregarious and an energetic man, um, as he would need to be with these firms and uh, his extensive travel. Indeed, as I discovered to my slight surprise when I came to the conference this morning, he also had a firm handshake, something I had never um, <laughs> encountered before. Um, his origins were fairly modest, given those rather grand names which I've just been dishing out. His mother, Margaret McLean, was uh, from uh, seafaring stock. Uh, the name, of course, uh, on his father's side, coming from um, uh, be betraying his um, Manx origins, or the, the origins of, of, of his family on his father's side. He um, trained in stained glass and decorating and studied uh, during the 1860s. And I would mention that he studied at the Trustees Academy in Edinburgh. Uh, and also at the Working Men's College in London, uh, where he was in 1861. But I'll gloss over his background because you, many of you will know it, and if not, you can read about it in the very, a very fine publication which is uh, lying over there to be purchased. Um, and um, I would also mention that he worked for Field and Allen in Edinburgh and Leith in the early 1860s. Um, and um, in fact, he did a he did a, was at Walter McFarlane. He married the boss's daughter, in fact, as well. Um, after he left Field and Allen, he married Marion. Uh, and so um, he was you know, sort of moving up socially um, as he went along. Um, we know about his um, life in Edinburgh, um, where he first established himself as, as his own business in 1864 at 24 George Street. And that's very significant to mention because he was in the same building as the architects Campbell Douglas and Stevenson. And so it's there that he met uh, people like Bruce Tolbert, William Leeper, and John McKean Bryden, and William Wallace, who all worked for that firm. And so that w these names would be very significant in uh, certainly the early part of his career uh, in London with Cotty and Company. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's the interior of um, the Elms at Arbroath, designed by William Leeper and decorated by Cotier in the 1860s. And it shows what he was now capable of uh, in his independent uh, practice. This was for David Corsar, um, the Pro Provost Corsar. Um, and the, uh, the Aberdeen connections and, um, in the Aberdeen area were very important to Cotier and I think explain his 
tra tra rather impressive trajectory. Around the circle of John Forbes White, who was a flour miller and, and a scholar and many other things, including a collector of contemporary paintings, um, Cossier began to develop his eye and his sense for paintings. In fact, he made a very successful job of um, art dealing towards, um, you know, in, in the main part of his career. So the Aberdeen connection was to be extremely important to him. And next slide, please. Here's a letterhead from Cotier and Company and its correspondence from the 1870s. And I thought it was worth showing, as well as showing Cotier's handwriting, um, because it gives the uh, anchor trademark of the company, which alludes to Cotier's seafaring background. But it also has a quotation which translates from Latin, from Quintilian, as the learned understand the principles of art, the unlearned feel its pleasure. And I think here we have got to the core of the aesthetic movement here. And Cotier was literally um, sort of pinning his colours to the mast. The sensory pleasure of art was as important as its intellectual content. And that's something we're going to see time and time again. And Cotier was uh, also moving up uh, in materially as well as socially. By 1871, he'd uh, moved into the very grand house, number three, St. James's Terrace, overlooking uh, the northern fringes of Regent's Park. So uh, a very fashionable area where his neighbours included the painter uh, Lawrence Almotadema. Next slide, please. And it's very interesting. Sally touched so interestingly on the question of um, the workshop um, practice. Here is the painter's window again from Aberdeen from the mid-1870s. Um, and this was uh, paid for by John Forbes White, um, jo the painter George Reed, uh, Alexander Mac MacDonald of Keppelston, amongst other subscribers. But what's interesting is that a photograph of, that wind of, of the cartoons for that window, which su survives in a private collection, is inscribed. It's just off the slide, but you'll have to take my word for it. It says that it was um, reproduced from the designs of Daniel Cotier. So we have this idea as, I think, uh, whether or not that's true or not, to what extent it's true, uh, certainly it would suggest, as Sally has outlined, the fact that Cotier was throwing out designs and these were developed by his team of um, designers, uh, who included Norman McDougall, who was mentioned, um, and there were other glass painters we know of, um, many of them from Scotland. Uh, there was uh, uh, Duncan Dewar, um, there was Charles Gow, um, and um, there was an, an English painter well, born in Lancashire called William J James Nelson, who was uh, one of the most talented painters in the studio. Um, and he was living in London until the 1890s, so perhaps he had a long association with the firm. The um, Cotier and Company produced uh, some of the most beautiful stained glass windows uh, of the 1870s. Next slide, please. For example, um, at St. Nicholas Cramlington, where um, Christ in glory is, fl is flanked by two figures symbolizing the Psalms, which becomes a bold, painterly, and rather luxurious exercise in um, color, flowing line, and beautiful um, detail. Red gold, created by silver stain, browns and greens predominate in, in the color palette. Next slide, please. And in the magnificent uh, uh, Norman MacLeod Memorial Window, formerly at Crathy Church, and now in storage, I think, uh, or maybe on display with Gla at Glasgow Museums, um, we can see again not only the sensuous colour, but fascinating to compare it with the slightly earlier version of the same um, subject of King David uh, from, from here, from the 1860s. And you can just see how uh, the studio had, uh, the style of Cotier's windows had moved on uh, in the 1860s. 70s. Next slide, please. At Caloran House, uh, a lot of Cotier's Scot uh, commissions continued to come from Scotland, even though the firm was based in, uh, and the glass was being produced in, in London. Uh, at Caloran House at Ochterarder, designed by Leeper, uh, in Perthshire, we have this fantastic example of a, of a house, um, and this collaboration, as we are sitting in or standing in today, a Leeper-Cotier collaboration. Uh, with its beautiful stained glass windows, including that of Flora. Next slide, please. And the even more magnificent Cairndu House at Helensborough from the early 1870s for um, a grain miller and art collector, Provost Ewer. Um, and the building cost of that house and fitting out in the 1870s came to £8,000, which was the same as this entire church cost to build, I believe. Uh, next slide, please. Inside uh, Cairndu, um, 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 we can still uh, see um, 
the uh, beautiful details such as the painted ceiling. And I was thinking um, when we were looking at the Templeton designs, many of them by Tolbert um, earlier, that um, rather reminded me of the, um, the, the border design here used on the ceiling um, of the, of the um, drawing room was rather reminiscent of, of the sort of textile designs which were being produced at the time. Tolbert was one of the early, um, Bruce James Tolbert was one of the early partners in the firm. Next slide, please. And in the dining room, there, um, there's a magnificent fireplace set with tiles. Now, these were cottier tiles, and although they are now, uh, have now been removed, um, there are some similar tiles which um, uh, belong to a private collector in the United States, and I reproduce one here. It shows um, the figure of love. And in fact, if you look very closely, perhaps on the small screens, it is in fact one of the tiles which was incorporated into the, um, to the fireplace. So we can get some impression from these remaining fragments of some of the colour and the luxury which uh, Cotier was able to incorporate uh, into his interiors. And I've always imagined it was the same painters painting the ceramics as it was the glass. And in fact, I assume that the ceramics were being fired in the kilns, which by the 1870s were running once a week in, in London. Next slide, please. Some presentation designs which were given to um, clients to approve um, have survived um, from the Cotier studio. And there, there are a number which have survived. And the one on the left is for, as you can see, a commission in Dundee. And it's rather interesting to compare the figure of painting uh, on, on that, um, that design. They were one inch to a foot in scale um, and, and coloured up like the um, final windows. And you can compare that uh, with the charger. Um, these are painted on usually 15 inch um, mint and blanks, which the Cotier studio produced. And they produced a number of these. Next slide, please all on the back having the trademark anchor. They were Minton blanks, and rather amusingly, um, the painters always hid the word Minton when they drew the crossbar, um, <laughs> um, which, which I think is quite telling. Um, next slide, please. That charger, incidentally, is now in the National Museums, uh, Museum uh, of Scotland um, in, in Edinburgh. Here's another presentation watercolour, and you can see how the client had a choice Will we go for one ship scene on, on our flanking windows, or shall we have two? Um, and the, the figure is called Rest. Ne next slide, please. It's rather interesting because, in fact, it's the same figure which appears on some painted ceramic plaques, uh, one of a pair of ceramic plaques. Next slide, please. In the V&A, we just saw, um, we just saw uh, Day, and here is uh, the figure of Night. And it's this rather romantic colouring, this mood setting, this rather wistful gaze um, and the symbols of night, which I think come close to explaining the, the, the power, I think, of, of the Cotier Studio's best work. Um, and uh, all of these things, as Sally has really explained, combine to create um, some of their most successful pieces. Next slide, please. We see a similar palette used on this charger, a uh, rather lovely charger uh, uh, produced in uh, around 1882. Next slide. And this, which is uh, in the collection of uh, the Four Acres Trust, Charitable Trust. Next slide. As is this, which I've always thought must be um, a portrait of, uh, of uh, Daniel Cotier. And uh, this, again, dates from the 1880s, and it belongs to the Four Acres Charitable Trust. Now, Cotier and Company also produce furniture, as I mentioned, and this too reflects Cotier's keen nose for, innov for the innovative and fashionable. While it reveals the eclectic tastes of the 19th century, um, Cotier's furniture also forged a unique house style which distinguished it from his competitors, and there were many competitors in London, to name but one city, in the 1870s. Lots of Every company which produced furniture virtually was producing art furniture in some degree. Um, so if we look at the next slide, please. Um, here is um, one of the products of, of Cotier's London firm. Um, this is, this is a, a, a cabinet made of wood which is ebonized and also with sycamore which has been painted. It's effectively like pen work. Um, and the technique is rather, rather um, I suppose, adaptable from people who are painting glass to painting furniture panels. So we can see how Cotier was able to use his workforce to be um, adaptable for glass, ceramics, and furniture. Uh, next slide, please. This rather beautiful cabinet, which is now in the collection of uh, the Royal Museum uh, in uh, Edinburgh, 
um, is also using this penwork technique, and we can see that courtiers turn to the Northern Renaissance for this, uh, for, for the, for this um, cabinet. Now, I don't know who designed this furniture. I have a suspicion it was someone like John McKean Bryden, one of the architects whom Cotier was associated with and who briefly worked for the firm uh, as, a, as a sort of partner in the, uh, around 1870. And this cabinet's from the early 1870s. But I've got no proof of this. What I do know is that whoever it was was taking uh, elements from historical forms, uh, in this case, Northern Renaissance, and that would chime in also with Cotier's own interest in Dutch art, and um, he was increasingly being a, de a dealer in, in, in fine art, and, um, and then adapting it and bringing something new to it, in this case, the decoration, which, amazingly, is in fact um, the same as used on his, on his painted tiles, and you also find on stained glass. If you have a good cartoon, why not use it again and again and again? And that's what the, the firm did. And it's been very useful over the years um, to identify furniture because of its links with a signed window or maybe a, a signed uh, ceramic. Next slide, please. I couldn't resist showing to you what happens to all of us, I suppose, uh, when the Wheel of Fortune has turned and um, we are not sitting on the top of the wheel but are crashing down with our, cr our, cr with our crowns uh, sort of flying off. Um, next slide, please. But there was another element to Cotier's um, style, and, and it was the Anglo, what you might call the Anglo-Greek style. The exoticism, which uh, Robin was talking about earlier, is creeping in. And of course, this has to really be the influence of Alexander Greek Thompson, which was, has been so um, elegantly explained to us by, by Ian earlier, this, the, uh, earlier today. It's hardly surprising that Greek, uh, Egyptian, and Assyrian-inspired motifs should feature so heavily in Cotier's furniture, um, given his background decorating uh, and working with um, Alexander Thompson at Queen's, at, at, at Queen's Park Church, for example, in the 1860s in, in Glasgow. And in fact, it was, I was particularly interested that Ian showed the slide of the black marble fireplace with the incised decoration. Because uh, in 1869, uh, John Moore Smith, who um, may have been involved with Cotier around this time, um, published a design for a Gothic piano, and he said that it could be um, ebonized and gilded, quote, after the manner introduced some years ago by Mr. Alexander Thompson of Glasgow in his Greek buildings. Next slide, please. So we can see not only in the form, but also in the decoration, most of these pieces are in private collections. We can see in the decoration, um, this, uh, although it's painted, not incised, and it's painted in a sort of creamish or ivory colored paint, we get this idea that Cotier may have um, been inspired by the incised decoration on, on, the, on, the, on the Thompson buildings. And I think it's very plausible. Next slide, please. And I'm just taking the corner of one cabinet and a clip of a, of a Thompson building just to sort of emphasize that, um, that idea. Next slide, please. Um, a, a very grand piece of furniture in this style is, uh, is a piano, a grand piano. Um, and this was made for um, uh, a Miss Alice Hare or Mrs. John Westlake. Um, she and her husband were um, uh, supporters of women's suffrage. And they knew the Garrett cousins, who two ladies who worked with Cotier, uh, trained with them in the early 1870s, when most decorators would not have really allowed women to work. In their, for their firms, um, at, least, uh, uh, at least ladies um, of, 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 a sort of, of a certain class. So it was very interesting that um, probably Cotier was able to use all the connections he had, including the social connections of some of the people who worked with him, in order to expand his business. The next slide, please. Uh, this piano, which is in a private collection, was sent to Cotier's to be decorated. Uh, at that time, the, um, show, the uh, showroom and workshop was at Langham Place, near the hotel, near the BBC. Next slide, please. We can see here in this detail the, the um, gilded sections of the um, case and also the decoration, the very fine Greek-style um, decoration, which has been um, painted onto the ebonized surface of the uh, mahogany. Next, uh, next slide, please and these masks which uh, appear uh, throughout the case. The case took 10 weeks to decorate um, and then was um, sent back to Broadwood, the maker of the mechanism for some tuning, I guess, and then sent over to, um, um, sent over to the client.
Uh, next slide, please. But the finest cabinet, and it rather reminds me of the, of, of the Greek Thompson uh, cabinet, which we saw is, uh, is on loan to Homewood, um, is, is probably the most uh, sensational piece of courtier furniture, and I probably epitomizes, um, well, certainly for me, uh, the Gilded Age. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a detail of it. Not only have you this magnificent decoration, which uh, chimes in so, so um, uh, sort of convincingly with, with, with Greek Thompson style, but also you have, as Sally was discussing, this um, fascinating and sophisticated use of color, combinations and, and, and um, pitches of tone. In here, the olive greens and the Pompeian colors, the Pompeian red, uh, which I think harmonize beautifully and uh, have a soothing effect. And, and a very rich effect as well. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned that Cotier expanded his business and he opened, um, um, he opened businesses in, in New York City uh, as well as in Australia. And the New York branch was at 144 Fifth Avenue. And James Ingalls, a young artist from Edinburgh originally, was installed as the managing director. So it was now that Cotier had a chance to expand his horizons and he, he was commissioned to do a number of important um, jobs, uh, including the Union League Club and the lavish interiors of, the, of a banker called Joseph Decker. And I'll just read you who had made his money from funding the Northern Pacific Railroad in the 1880s. And I'll just read you a quick description of his parlor, which Cotier has converted into a place of princely but peaceful splendor. Silk damask of an exquisite rose pink covers the walls from frieze to wainscot, and the ceiling is painted in bronze. A costly Renaissance mirror hangs above the mantelpiece. And as for the furniture, it is costliness itself. So, um, well, a bronze ceiling, not a gold one, but um, um, it certainly sounds very grand. Next slide, please. But the middle market, too, was also something which Cotier tried to corner, and it was through this, uh, the publication of Clarence Cook's House Beautiful. In fact, Cotier designed the cover. The frontispiece is by um, Walter Crane. Um, and in it, um, Cotier was able to um, increase his uh, spread, uh, uh, his, um, uh, his market to the, to the middle market. And a lot of the furniture which he sold in New York was of a plainer type than, than that we have seen. It was made in New York. And a lot of it was ebonized and was um, copying or inspired by or plagiarizing, depending how you would like to look at it, um, the work of other designers, including E.W. Godwin, uh, Anglo-Japanese furniture. Next slide, please. Um, it was in America that some of the most uh, magnificent windows produced in London were sent. Uh, John Lafarge had failed to provide designs in a timely manner for the uh, Harvard Memorial Hall, and a Cotier stepped in with this magnificent, well, in fact, there are two sets of windows. This is uh, one of them showing um, um, Sir Philip Sidney and Ep Epaminodas, um, the Theban uh, general, um, two figures which uh, had, a, had a, uh, a connection with, uh, with war or battle. Um, the other is uh, Sir Philip Sidney and um, the figure on the left. Uh, and, and this window was to commemorate the fallen of the Civil War. Next slide, please. And another domestic piece, although more domestic in tone, were the um, absolutely magnificent windows in the Japanese style, which were produced for William Watt Sherman at his Newport house uh, at Rhode Island. And this is from this was originally in the main hall, three light three light windows, which um, show Cotier's personal interest in the Japanese style. And Robin was talking about the exoticism and mysticism of the East and how that filtered into design. And Cotier was a prime example of using this um, in these really um, richly harmonious and sophisticated uh, uh, windows, which are, uh, I think, now in, in, in Boston, no longer at the house. Next slide, please. And just a detail of one of the upper panels of, of the, the Watt Sherman windows. Um, next slide, please. And we have the figure of um, spring here. Uh, this is uh, from a set of the seasons, which um, belonged to Cotier's family. And uh, again, shows um, the type of work which Cotier was supplying to clients in the uh, 1870s. Next slide, please. Autumn, of course, possibly from the same set, although there are a number of sets of this. Next slide, please. And just a detail from that window.
Next slide, please. Um, Sally talked um, very interestingly about the uh, inspiration for the windows. And I wanted to show you one. I should have shown you the engraving on which it's based. But Cotier adapted designs from other um, sources. And this, of course, you may recognize. It's a copy of one of the, or it's taken from one of the uh, wood engravings which illustrated the parables of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and this one, this plate was uh, designed, uh, this, this was designed by John Everett Millay and it was published in 1863. Now other artists, I think including Stephen Adam, but uh, forgive me if I'm wrong or correct me if I'm wrong, used uh, the same plates from the book. But what I thought was rather interesting was that Cotty has aestheticized the image. The studio has, in the, in the engraving, it's a very plain background, but here we have a buffet and we have chargers on the um, banked up upon the, the buffet. And in fact, we've effectively um, turned this uh, scene into um, what was called by the critics the furniture and bric-a-brac of Cotier's um, New York galleries um, in, in a rather nice way. Next slide, please. Um, but what have become perhaps um, one, two of the best known um, windows by Cotier are in England. And it just shows what Cotier could, what the studio could do for, um, for, its, um, for its customers. And this was the, uh, these are the two windows which were designed um, for the, uh, William Carnegie, the Earl of North Esk, who um, lived uh, in Hampshire um, in, towards the end of his life. And he was uh, predeceased by his wife and daughter. And um, Cotier produced, the Cotier studio produced uh, two um, striking windows in which, with Marian attributes, he slipped in portraits of the deceased. Uh, Lady um, Mary Carnegie and her mother, the Countess of North Esk. Next slide, please. And in fact, I found um, a carte de visite of Lady Margaret, for example, known as Mina in the family. She died a couple of weeks before, uh, a couple of weeks after her 23rd birthday in the early 1870s. Next slide, please. And you can see how the Cotier studio was able to incorporate her, complete with a halo. So um, you could be memorialized in, in an utterly aesthetic fashion. And she is, in fact, as, as a sort of ambiguously aesthetic uh, virgin figure, is holding a lily, clutching a lily in her hands in the memorial window. Next slide, please. The windows became quite famous because, in fact, it was uh, whilst he was in London that Van Gogh visited the Cotier studio in 1876. And he was so taken with the designs for the windows, he didn't see the windows themselves, that he wrote a letter, in a letter to his brother Theo, describing them. And he talked of the noble face. Next slide, please. If any of you can read Dutch. I um, just thought I'd put that up. This is the section from the letter, which is now at the Van Gogh Museum, in which he describes seeing the windows at uh, the Courtiers London studio. Next slide, please. But you're never a prophet in your own land. Um, and um, Courtier died um, only at the age of 53 in Jacksonville in Florida. And uh, it was said at the time in the New York Times, um, his death at the age of 53 removes one who never posed as a patron of the arts. I wonder if that was a dig at Oscar Wilde, but did much to widen the knowledge of what is beautiful. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful epitaph. But sadly, his work has not always fared so well. Here is that great west window in uh, St. Giles Cathedral. And it's only known now, I believe, through photographs. Here is a photograph from the Cotier Studio archives. And it was replaced in St. Giles Cathedral by uh, a more contemporary work uh, in the 1980s. Next slide, please. And of course, Queen's Park Church, which a United Presbyterian Church, which was tragically destroyed during, uh, uh, during an air raid in 1942. Next slide, please. There was Town Head United Presbyterian Church, surely one of the saddest losses which this city has suffered. Uh, it was demolished but for the spire uh, in 1997. However, fortunately, the uh, great Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Company windows um, were removed before that happened. Next slide, please. But the deterioration of the interior was absolutely uh, heartbreaking to see as it fell into disrepair. Next slide, please. And then there was Park Church in Glasgow, which suffered a similar fate, in, I think, in the 1960s, um, replaced by an office block and then replaced by an equally ugly office block, I think, a few years ago. And the whole of the main church was destroyed. Next slide, please. 
So we've probably lost the great um, memorial window, great chancel window of 1889, which again is only known through uh, one of those presentation um, watercolours. Next slide, please. And I was sorry to see that Cairndu House is now lying empty and boarded up. And there's one of the stained glass panels, which, which, you can, which is on the right-hand side uh, of the porch. And so one hopes that some good use will be found for that. Been boarded up for five years now. Next slide, please. Um, the, the, the beautiful um, elms has fallen into a dreadful state, um, and, and which is really quite, um, quite unacceptable, I think. Next slide, please. However, I didn't want to end on an entirely sad note, except to say that I hope that uh, any buildings which uh, are surviving are going to be looked after. Um, Cotier, as I said at the beginning, uh, pandered to the rich and the wealthy. Uh, the Great and the Good. Um, in December 1888, he sold these two Rembrandts, which now hang in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, to uh, Henry Osborne Havemeyer um, for $60,000. They are the uh, 1632 portraits of the Van Bernstein family. So it shows quite the sort of league that Cotier was dealing in as an art dealer. Next slide, please. In fact, Matthew Maris, the Dutch painter who worked for him, said that Cotier being a house decorator, Everything was turned into gold. Um, Maris didn't get on very well with Cotier to, for most of the time. Everything was turned into gold. Golden ceilings, golden closets, golden baths, golden grates. I said to someone, the next time he returns from America, he will wear golden waistcoats and golden trousers. Well, I don't know if he did. It, he, he wasn't wearing golden trousers this morning, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> But this fantastic clock was a collaboration with Cotier and Louis Comfort Tiffany, and it was made for uh, Ishabod uh, Williams, who was a wealthy lumber merchant and a collector who bought paintings from Cotier. And it's now, it's just been acquired, um, I hear, for, by the Brooklyn Museum. Next slide, please. And this is, um, this is Clayton at Pittsburgh, the house in which Henry Clay Frick lived for, uh, during the 1880s till about 19. Or five, uh, a little um, 23 room chateau style mansion. Next, please, which is now a museum. And inside, uh, that's Henry Clay Frick with his daughters, uh, with one of his daughters, Helen. And um, he, ins ins perhaps to inspire his daughters, he put in the Four Virgins windows um, by Cotier in 1903 1904, doubtless to encourage um, their behaviour. Um, next, please, is Cara. Leyland Rogers, the oil heiress, whose father had the good fortune to found Standard Oil. She later became Lady Fairhaven. We see her here in her, in her champagne-coloured pearl-encrusted silk wedding dress from 1890, the first of her two marriages. And uh, she had, uh, her father bought her a cotier piano made of satin wood and decorated with painted figures. Next, please. And here's a detail of it. It's now at Anglesey Abbey, which is where the family moved in the 1880s. Uh, sorry, in 1912. The piano dates from the late 80s, early, uh, early 1900s. And um, who could be more glamorous to finish with, next slide please, than um, Miss Gertrude Vanderbilt, painted here by Sir John Everett Millay, aged 13. Um, of course, coming from the shipping and railroad dynasty, we just saw pictures of uh, Biltmore earlier. Um, she spent her summers, uh, winters in New York, and summer at the Breakers, that, um, the, what's called a cottage in Newport. Um, it had 70 rooms, in fact, um, uh, built uh, in the style of an pla uh, Italian palazzo. Um, she, uh, not that she really needed it, but she had the good fortune to marry well. Next slide, please. And she became Mrs. Harry Payne Whitney in 1896, which was most fortunate as her husband came to inherit $36 million from his family. So it was a, it was a great marriage from that point of view. And um, she ordered from Cotier a tortoise shell veneered and mother of pearl inlaid piano depicting composers and revelers. It's either this piano or one very like it, but I've only found one. I believe there was more than one. And that, I hope, is a glamorous enough end to my talk on Daniel Cotier. Thank you very much.